So if you can go on the internet, you can type in Jody Daniels. You can find out all kinds of information about me. What do you have inside that's connected to other information that no one else is going to have? What's that non-public information? And how are you protecting that? Who's using it? And what questions are you asking before you go on your merry way to design release update? And as part of that, from a legal perspective, um, when you're when any of your companies, whether you're large or small, you know, they, even for fraud mark, you know, or any, any small website, you collect information, are you getting the consent of the person who's giving it to you? Europe, under the new GDPR, is all over them. They, you know, they, they, they've covered everything in terms of how are you, are you getting consent. You know, for your medical records, you're an understanding universe. You've got to consent to giving the doctor anything. You want to get a copy of your records sent here, you've got to get consent. You want to do this, you've got to get consent. Same thing in your business. If you're collecting information, how are you getting the consent of the person you're getting from? Because if there's a problem, if your legal language on your terms of use doesn't have it right, you know, that first off, the terms of use is not going to be enforceable. Right? Um, and second off, you're going to have a problem in terms of, you know, can you collect it? And then when you're, you're a small company, it's been sold, and you're going to sell all your data and everything else with it. And due diligence boys and girls come in and say, okay, let's look and see if, you know, did you collect the data in a way that allows you to basically assign it to the buyer of the company? And if you don't have that, guess what? You know, arguably, the buyer of the company doesn't get the data that you think you're going to be selling to them because you never got permission to assign or transfer the data. So in terms of, when you think of privacy by design, and you and I were talking about this before we ever talked, is in any of your products or when you're consulting, think about protecting privacy, how do you get the valuable information, and how is the consent? Most other countries outside the US have much higher privacy value, we we'll call it that, than the US. Even if you're a US company, and you're collecting data from European residents, and you've got customers in Europe, you got to deal with new data regulations coming on board next May. So the question is, you know, the question from, okay, so you know, what do you think about data? And the security and privacy aspects of it now force you to be thinking, when you're designing your products and your services, how are you collecting it? If the data doesn't matter, fine. But you know, if, if you're running a community, how are you thinking about the data you're collecting, the posts, the content? Right. And I would add to it, so we talked about consent. Um, and in the US, I think here people, we kind of tell you what we do in our privacy notice, and then we give you some choices. And in some situations, you have to consent. In Europe, it's completely the opposite. It's a fundamental right to privacy. You get privacy first, then I ask you, can I do something? And then you have the, if you say yes, and then you change your mind, I have to be able to easily undo what you just told me I can do very easily. Be forgotten. Right, the right to be forgotten. Um, and a lot of people, I love what you said, people think it is only if I'm, a U, if I'm a European company, I have operations somewhere. No, 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 if this follows the user, it follows the resident. Um, and I was just going to use a simple example in terms of uh, by design and the notice aspect. So I don't know how many people here have used the Unroll Me service. You, you sign up to too many things, you want to unsubscribe really fast. So to me, this is a great example of where privacy by design goes here. So you sign up for this thing, you unroll, and magically you don't get this anymore. Well, people then realized, oh, my information was sold. It was a free service. My information was sold. They didn't tell anyone who signed up for the service that to use the service, your information is going to be sold. And so executive management was, well, how did you think it was going to be for free in the first place? Well, I have a long list of ways you could have communicated that. That's for another day. But it's really about well, how did you communicate? Did you get consent to do that? How did you communicate? What notice did you provide to your customers? Where is that data going? Who did you even send it to? What data did you tell them about me? So really thinking through all those basic steps to be able to help protect the data is a very, I mean, we talk about intrusions and all these other pieces, but the design element in that intersection of privacy and security is really fundamental. And if you're a company which is doing outsourced work, for example, you have a US, small U.S. software development company, 
and some of the, the developers in Bangalore, right? And data is not being transferred, but is being accessed from Bangalore. You're in the cloud. Guess what? You know, you're now, your US data is now going overseas. Not being transferred, it's being accessed. Right? So you know, what we've got to think about is cloud structure. Where is the data being stored? Where is the data being accessed from? Currently. What do you think? How, how do people start thinking about that kind of issue in terms of security? Is this a security and privacy discussion? Right, and, and that's part of, you know, when you, as you said, privacy by design means that you need to design your system from the ground up to be able to take care of these cases. And unfortunately, that's not usually on the top of the, you know, the CTO's mind or the CEO, you know, the new star founder saying, hey, I have this cool idea, I can go sell it to AT&T, for example, or, or to General Motors or this hospital chain, and you know, this is cool, they, they like it, and are they asking the right questions? Where is this data going? And typically, as you said, it's bootstrapped here with the couple of engineers and said, no, now we need to expand, let's get a team in Ukraine, a team in Bangalore, a team in Thailand. And I've had companies, I've talked to companies which have all three, right? So now it's not just one country. And now each of those countries has their own regulations as well. So, for, uh, so the way some countries are uh, targeting that, Europe specifically, is that they want the data on their citizens to be in their location. They don't want it to be in the U.S. So you can you talked about the access point, right? So the U.S. does not have that. So there is a problem then in the case that data in the U.S. could be anywhere. In Brazil or in Europe, the data has to be in Brazil or in Europe. In, in Russia and China. Look what Apple just did, you know, in terms of being able to have it locally there. <coughs> And I think India is also following a lot. India has been following a lot of the Western, uh, Western European standards. So they're coming down the same path as well. So a lot of new privacy regulations. So in, sadly, in one sense, the U.S. is sort of a laggard in some of those. So if you th if you got if you if maybe the moral of this part of it is if you've got data that you're collecting from customers and users outside the U.S., you by contract may want to having to or designing to have your data center in let's say Ireland. In Ireland, the Republic of Ireland is still part of Europe. It's not part of Brexit. Right, right. um, and one of my clients having to do this right now. We're going to Turkey. We got Turkish banking data we're getting. You know, we don't want to bring it to the United States. We're going to keep it in Europe. So we might we might want to open up a, a virtual data center in another country to keep the data in Europe. So it's part of that. We are now hitting 740. Um, yes. Sean, yeah. time to open so it up. Let's turn it over to audience questions. I want to, put, want to uh, wake everybody up and open it up to audience. Please keep your questions brief in the sense that I'm going to repeat the question because we are streaming live, so I can answer it. Please, sir. Yeah. So in response to what you're talking about, when we negotiate about SLAs, that's always the question. Where does the data reside and when can it be accessed? So part of the SLA is that the data is residing in the U.S., but your administrator happens to go over to Europe on business, and they access the data, who really has control of the data? So we get into some extremely legalese, nitpicky arguments about that. And there's, you know, one of the ways, like you just said, is a data center in the UK, I'm sorry, in Ireland. And that was, that appeased everybody. So this is a common rather question. I'll summarize it that in you know, service level agreements or SLAs, uh, the prime issue that you know the lawyers want to get involved with is, you know, who's got the button, who's got the data, where did the data go, where is it collected from, where is it going, who can access it. Other questions, please. Yes, sir. Uh, so it seems like a lot of U.S. companies might be caught a little bit flat-footed by these, you know, stronger data privacy laws globally. Uh, so what do you guys think that? biggest challenges or biggest hurdles these U.S. companies are going to be encountering as, as, as they go to secure their customers' data for uh, you know, European Union residents or Indian residents? So the question is, what are some of the best practices to be starting to think about um, when your company wants to start expanding out as, as user-based, customer-based, whatever, outside the U.S., and you've got to start thinking about data and data collection, data storage, data access, whatever processing in other countries. Okay, so so I think I have a thought on it. I you bring up the second half. We're going to partner and duo here. So uh, the very first piece is companies need to know 
what they have. They need to inventory, they need to do what's often called a GDPR assessment, uh, which is, if you break it down to basic terms, what do you have? Map it out into the different systems and literally the type of data that you have. And, and a big piece of it is you have to understand its use. So not just what you have, so I have Joby Daniels, where am I being used? Am I being used to provide a product or a service? Am I being used for marketing purposes? Am I being used because I'm an employee? So being very rudimentary, but really that assessment is the very first piece to then being able to understand how you uh, comply with the requirements in terms of protection of any firms that finish your thought. Yeah, and, and as you said, uh, really part of the, the very first problem is the e-books, not even knowing that you have to do these kind of uh, protections. So one of the, I mean, a simple example is a small company will start out, you know, they have multiple customers all over the world, but they don't, they just put all into one database. And then you start dealing with bigger organizations and what you take, you start looking at the SLAs and there are questions in there. Where is the data that you're going to provide? Where, where are you going to save it? And then you realize you, you've already gone down the path, your product is in the market for a year, now you need to go back and re-architect all that, all that data, all that structures, what you've done, has to be rethought about it. And that's really the challenge is, you know, for a small startup doesn't want to think about that, they just want to run quickly and get it done as quickly as possible, as cheap as possible, because the moment you start putting multiple databases, one for each ten tenant or each customer, it becomes, the complexity keeps increasing. So you need to design that from day one, in the expectation that you will go larger, right? So that's what you need to sort of keep in mind, and that's the biggest challenge is, you know, security is always an afterthought. Unfortunately, privacy and security is always considered an afterthought. And it's going to cost you a lot more to fix it down the road than have to do it, you know, right in the beginning. And as a quick, uh, you know, you talk about some of the SLAs, right? So one of the companies that I'm working for, they said, we have the SLA, and they had this question, is the data going to go to India? Is it going to a third party country? And we said, no, everybody's here. And then we got a conference call with them, and their administrators were in Mexico. It's like, hold on. <laughs> Did you know that your administrators are in Mexico? Because they, it's like, hold on, what's going on here? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to tag on some thoughts to, to what we just heard, which is that what you're hearing is you need to have a plan to begin with. Often there is no plan, and then you get compromised and your data gets taken. And when that happens, that's when you should you should pick up the phone. You shouldn't worry about trying to minimize, you know, you should have your lawyers and your business needs to understand its obligations to its, to its customers, but you also, as a company, should be concerned about getting this compromise, this intrusion addressed. You can't just sweep it under the rug. If you do that, it's going to keep happening, and the way that you get it to stop is by contacting law enforcement, and what we see um, from time to time is this uh, reticence uh, kind of a fear of calling the FBI because if you do that, you're going you're going to get in trouble somehow, that it's going to be your fault that this data got compromised. And that's not what the FBI is there to do. They're there to figure out how the intrusion happened and to work at finding out who conducted that intrusion. It's not about we're, it's not about figuring out you know, who, who signed the contract that resulted in the data being sent over to a server that nobody was thinking about, and it just happened to have been compromised now, and now this credit card information is floating out there. I mean, uh, I, I guess the, the, the thought is just you can't cry over the spilled milk. You just got to clean it up, and part of cleaning it up is dealing with the fact that the data's been taken, and then taking the steps to uh, help stop it from happening again. And also sometimes insurance uh, comes into play. So, okay, so what have you done to take care of things? Another thought, I think the question is just a moment. Another thought is a radical idea. If you're a company that is sort of getting data as part of your work, let's say you're in a software implementation or you're an outsourcing company, don't accept personally identifiable information. Don't accept it. Mask it. Encrypt it. Or have your, your, your customer encrypted, mask it. You know, just because you're working on it in software and you're getting data doesn't mean that data has to be identifiable. You don't need it. If you don't need the, the data to be identifiable, figure out a way for, for them to, that the customers, your customers end to mask it or encrypt it. Obviously, you don't have a key. But Jason Bernstein becomes J123. That's all you need. If you don't need the information which makes it personally identifiable, it all of a sudden opens up this Pandora's box of liability, 
their exposure, don't take it. Figure out a way to say, we'll take the information, but I don't need social security number. I don't need credit card number for this. You can scrap you can scatter ran that out. You can filter it out. Don't take it. Yes, sir. You know, over the last uh, few weeks, and crypto coins, such as the blockchain technology, Bitcoin, price is going up. And what about this price of Bitcoin, right coin, impact about the ransomware? You know, people try to use it. Can you make some comment about this? Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, 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 uh, the question is on um, Bitcoin. Price of Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin right now is what gold used to be going to. Um, so, in, in the context of Bitcoin, so what in, in ransomware? What the, what are you seeing? So, one of the other emerging trends that we're starting to see is the use of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, Litecoin. There's you know maybe ten or fifteen other Bitcoin too. Uh, yeah, a the, of weeks the ago. recent the recent split off of Bitcoin as well. Um, we're seeing these technologies used to commit crimes, used to commit money laundering, and um, in the context of certain types of ransomware, for example, uh, they have been attempted to be used for the purpose of collecting ransoms, and we've seen that used in other types of cases as well, not just in ransomware. There, there are methods, and I won't go into the details, of trying to identify who is the owner of a particular wallet or a particular uh, position on the blockchain or the ledger or whatever you want to call that piece of data that's sitting out there in the public domain for people to look at. There are technologies and methods and analytics that can be used to try and understand who actually controls this particular Bitcoin wallet or this particular Ethereum wallet. Uh, and ultimately the money has to come out the money has to be, it has to be turned into paper cash somewhere. And somebody's bank account somewhere is going to get that money. Um, so in some instances, we're finding that we're able to follow the money in that sense. Um, and, you know, the technology keeps getting better. And I think now there's, for example, with Monero, there is uh, kind of a tumbler internally built money laundering effect that happens with Monero where when you put in one Monero and you give it to somebody, your one Monero is not actually going to them. You know, I don't understand the algorithm specifically, but I know that you, the, the Monero is fungible, so when I give somebody one Monero, my one Monero might go to person Z when I wanted to pay person Y, and person Y is getting one Monero from someone else. So we're both, the, the, the transaction has been executed, but it cannot be traced in the way that, for example, a Bitcoin transaction can still be traced. It's still A to B. A Monero transaction may be may go through several routes, and it's not going to be that particular coin that I put in that ends up in the pocket of whoever I'm paying. So it's, um, it's still going to matter of the good guys are always right. one step behind it's, the bad guys. It's always yeah. an evolving technology, and there are uh, there are analytics that are done to try and track where the money goes. And even there's public information too on the internet. You can go look and see. There's blockchain, I think it's blockchain.info that can give you kind of that high level picture of where money is moving. It's a, let's do some questions. Uh, the Just, European restrictions on keeping their data in Europe and not letting it go out actually goes back to the 1960s. That was the case back then and it was a problem back then. So the comment was uh, the concept of, of a country wanting to keep its data in the country, at least certainly on the servers of the country, goes back to the 60s and, and perhaps uh, you know, when the concept of data in and of itself as, it, as an asset it was, uh, was being born. Any other questions? Okay, so to wrap up, uh, you know, it's, an, it's a world now where obviously everybody's thinking about these kind of issues in the context of your own business. Uh, so, uh, we're all becoming far more aware of how data is transforming our lives and also how you are using it to transform your business. There isn't a business out there that's not using data or could use data in some way. So when you think about the security of data, you've got to think about it as Josie's saying, from the start to the finish, as you design your products and your services, think about these issues now, it's a whole lot less expensive in the design process. When you have things that go wrong, um, you know, Call law enforcement. In these cases, 
It's not like it is on television. They are your friends. Um, they can act, you know, if, if something happens at a big enough scale, um, and you get them on wire fraud, you get them within 48 hours or so, they have connections all over the world, and banks in almost every single country, maybe except for North Korea, that they can get the money back sometimes. If it's fast enough, by wire. It's gone from the U.S., but in that cycle, it can come back. I want to end it, so finish up. Um, as you think about what you should do with your, with your data from a cloud standpoint, uh, where you're putting it, how you're putting it, uh, be more aware of not just what you want to do, but what is going to be required of you. you know, and if you're, let's say, you're a US, US company, right, and eventually you think you might be acquired, the company that's acquiring you is, is Belgium right, or India, they're going to be far more interested in your data in, in terms of, of how you're protecting it, how you're getting consent than a US company will. So when you start having those questions that early due diligence, you want to sell your company, be prepared for that. Yes, here's how we do it. So again, we're not just going to be behind the game, we just have a lot lower, uh, I won't say value, but focus on the protectability and, and, and the right of privacy, the right to be forgotten. And California is leading those, some of those efforts in the US. You know, if you're doing business in certain states, you've got to think about California is always the white coast state, but they're the ones who are the bell setters. So I want to thank everybody for, uh, for, your, for your attention, for your comments and questions. I want to thank my panelists and thank Web Technology Forum for the, uh, for the place and the time. Thank you and have a good evening.